I'm now joined by Carl Heath and Linda Aronson. Carl is from the Interactive Institute, um, just across the yard, randomly. And, uh, and, and Linda, of course, is a, is a screenwriter and a script consultant, among many other things. Uh, many kinds of writer, in fact, a novelist and a playwright as well. Um, and you're going to be hearing from her uh, later this afternoon. Um, but I would like uh, for you guys to talk uh, I would like for us to, to, to talk now about the storytelling challenges and opportunities that are presented um, for traditional film because of everything that's changing and also that are presented in, in these new kinds of filmmaking uh, like AR and, and VR that are opening up. So perhaps very briefly at the beginning we should just say in which ways are you working with these with this media already? And Carl, I know you're involved uh, in VR. Can you talk a little bit to that? Uh, yes, so yeah, I work just over the yard at the Interactive Institute where we have a small lab uh, where we explore all kinds of stuff, some relating to VR and AR uh, and 360 video content. So we've explored both production of educational context with sort of participatory first person 360 VR experiences and we've explored also um, different types of AR storytelling. We built a uh, kind of time machine for the uh, Vitlicke Museum up in Tarnum, where uh, you <laughs> sort of Sorry. Sorry. Where you can uh, look into this time machine and uh, see the Bronze Age uh, portrayed and uh, interactions and small films going on inside of it. So, well, yeah, basically the whole spectra of, uh, of, of more participatory ways of working with AR and VR. And, and I know you're a technology uh, research institute, but, but uh, the reason you're here specifically is that, that you, are, you have this interest in storytelling. I was, for instance, in a, in a session where, where they had c collaborated with a, with a playwright and an actor director to, and they had audience members with brain scanners on, yeah. <laughs> and then they told a story that d developed differently depending on on whether the hats on the people's head lighted up in, lit up in different colors. Yeah, we, we wanted to explore uh, collective and conscious, so we built an interactive narrative based on the subconscious mind of the collective audience. Yeah. I, I just mentioned this because it, it says the range of the weirdness that is possible with this technology and, and that some of these tech people are also actually deeply invested in stories. And uh, Linda, what about you? Um, well, uh, I spend a lot of time um, talking to people, uh, writers and directors, and now increasingly games and uh, cross-media people about non-linear narrative and how we can construct uh, flashbacks, time jumps, multiple storyline pieces like Pulp Fiction because they work to they work to patterns, and one there are actually structural templates for writers that make you able to write them faster and with more assurance, which makes it cheaper and so on. In my own personal work, I'm very interested in, in VR and AR, and I am using my experience using multi-linear, uh, non-linear, multiple storylines to create completely controlled, at the moment, completely controlled immersive virtual reality uh, experiences in which, for example, you will um, have, one, you'll have five storylines and a documentary simultaneously in 360 degrees and hopefully with holograms, but it's all rather difficult at the moment, and sound and touch and temperature and smell because it's terribly evocative. And this in one particular story, for example, you will have a shocking incident at the start, a mysterious incident of a man being shot and crumbling, and then we will go into multiple storylines, text hanging in the air as we tell what that caused that and the after effect. And one of the storylines is actually somebody having post-traumatic stress, and we're seeing that intercut with the other stories. Now, storytelling-wise, it's complex because the audience must not lose where they are because they get angry. One of the things that fascinates me is this, this the, the neurological issues in all of this because people are responding with, largely with the limbic system, I think, which is a very primitive part of the brain. And if you mess them about, they get angry in a way that they don't get angry with fiction. So that's what I'm doing in, in my own work. And I'm also very interested now in bringing games and cross-media people together with writers and filmmakers from 
um, television and film because I think we have a lot to show each other. Uh, and I think that the games writers have been told that there's only a linear chronological m mode of storytelling, whereas inherently they're doing something that's multiple storylines, so they get themselves tangled up and they miss out on lots of chances. So that's really what I'm doing across my various things. Um, I, I would like to ask a little bit about this problem with the body, because of course, even if we're looking at, the, at a horror film or pornography or comedy, all of these body genres, of course, our, our body is responding. That's what this we are telling. That in this um, genre, this film is designed to to create physical effects. And everybody knows the thing when you get scared in a movie theater and you jump and scream and then you laugh because. And this has to do with the fact that the brain finds it very difficult to process what is fiction, and certainly that part of the brain is is very primitive at this. And only sort of after the fact can you put it in the fiction box. It's just a question of, of resolution. But when you're in these very realistic environments your mind will treat it as real in a different way. So, so the, the narrative distance becomes different or can become different? Uh, uh, well, I, I would, uh, th there's all kinds of theories about it. <laughs> At the moment, I've been nerding out about a theory called ecological psychology, where you look a lot about perception theory. And there's a, a couple called the Gibsons who have done a lot of research around that. And basically, the notion has been like, just as you say, the more immersed you are, the more vivid the experience, the more you would perceive yourself as the being within that context. Uh, but we're very good at understanding uh, as a human sort of what is actually going on and what is not, uh, unless you do something for the first time. So, I mean, when the first movies came about right. and there were trains, people were like throwing themselves about in the seats. And you wouldn't find that today if you showed somebody a train on, a, on, a, on, a, on an iPhone. Uh, they wouldn't like jump away scared from that. So, because we're sort of attuned to that medium. And I would think most likely we will become quite attuned to VR and, and these more immersive experiences as well over time uh, and accept that uh, more because there's still so many parts of our biology that's not a part of the virtual mm -hmm. experience. We still haven't solved the solution sort of to sort of how to integrate smell in a proper way or touch, for example, really hard to do touch. Or how to way. represent the, our bodies inside yeah, the yeah, space. Absolutely, yeah. so there's all kinds of issues and until we solve those technically, we will still have a, a quite a large gap. But right now in, in VR, there's, there's a real challenge, which is that, that the experience of being, it, it's like you enter a room, you, you are physically present inside a story. And if there are humans in the story or some kind of creatures that, that in, uh, interact with each other, if it's, the question is, who are you? Who am I inside this story? Am I a character in this fiction or am I completely invisible? If I'm invisible and they're not looking at me, that's quite strange. But if they are looking at me and there's no way for me to, to respond, that's also actually quite strange. And that's one of the things that cr creates that alienation effect. And I wonder, Linda, how, for instance, in your piece that you're working on, is the, how is this handled? Is the audience member inside the fiction in some way? Is, do, would I represent a character? I think it, it, all of this stuff is incredibly interesting. I was talking to somebody working in VR in London at a very high level, and one of the things that they are worried about is that if, if at the moment it's too immersive, people will rip the mask off and then you've lost everything. I think the answer to this is better storytelling because you talked about the famous train coming mm. towards people, people jumping away. Um, well, that was about effects, and I think at the moment... A lot of people who are designing the digital stuff are actually getting very excited about the effects that they can create. But as you say, after the first couple of times, it gets boring. So what I'm very interested in is replayability, mm -hmm. as far as games are concerned, um, via emotions and storytelling. So what I am doing, I am doing everything I can in storytelling terms to smack people in the face, right? and engage them empath empathetically and through storytelling. And, and that's one of the, the, the big challenges because um, I think one of the, if we're looking theoretically at this, and I only have very roughly worked out the philosophy of it, but a lot of games to, are to do, in my view, with um, physical survival. You've got to shoot somebody or they'll shoot mm -hmm. you, or you've got to gather something. So it's hunters and gatherers, right? But a lot of the more powerful and difficult things about navigating one's life is dealing with the tribe. Mm. Emotional, it's emotional intelligence. And therefore, 
what I'm trying to do in my pieces is to actually take, a, use a storytelling technique, which is a, an ancient, ancient storytelling technique, which is that you start at a very emotionally powerful moment with somebody usually being in physical danger, and you get that adrenaline response, because I'm really working on getting the, 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 the cortisone moving, and then giving them a mystery. I'm doing it through mystery and jumping stories and confronting people emotionally. So it's very manipulative and I make no, you know, that, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing completely controlled experiences and then what I would like to do is to get them outside of that cave or that 360 degree experience. I think 360 degree is worrying, I have to say, for all sorts of storytelling reasons because they can look in a corner and see, you know, a bit of rubbish and <laughs> it just doesn't quite work. But um, to take them outside and then they can play a game based on this overarching story or the world that you've created and or they could go into a documentary aspect of it. A lot of the things I'm doing now are on war and post-traumatic stress and all of that, the empathy arousing stuff. So I'd be just hitting them emotionally and presenting problems of emotional interaction with people. It's story mm -hmm. in the end. And that's what people are coming to me for, because I'm not a games writer. Right? So it's, it's about how you manipulate story to pull people in. I realized there's something that I didn't quite spell out, and that is that <clears throat> VR development today is being approached from two completely different directions. So you have VR filmmaking. Um, I, I have, you, I'm using air quotes because because they're not entirely, they're not exactly movies, even when they are movies. P for lack of a better word, many people are calling them VR experiences now. And there's a clue in the name. There's something that I have to go and experience it. I have to go and do something. Some verb is implicit. At the very least, I am I'm moving about inside the story, but often I'm also exploring and sometimes I get to make active choices and so on. So that's one, that's one end. And those people tend to come from filmmaking. And at the very other end, there are VR games where I have quite a lot of agency and there the whole point is to, to, make, <coughs> to make actions that have some outcome for the story. But probably, I mean, it seems like like in the middle somewhere is where VR is going to be is super interesting and, and those people need to sort of meet. The, the, the games people, to be quite honest, they don't know very much about, about filmmaking or storytelling. And that's, I think, why they jump to these conclusions and say, oh, it has to be realistic or something. I think the most natural equivalent for uh, a VR environment would be a theater stage or a theater black box, where there's a physical space with a live audience and some things can be abstractly represented or something can be poetic. It doesn't have to be realistic at all times. I think you're onto something there because we did an experiment, uh, experimental 360 uh, educational uh, project this winter for the healthcare system where we wanted to uh, have doctors experience emotions uh, towards the situation of uh, meeting a patient with a stress syndrome. Uh, uh, and we wanted to create a very, very powerful, engaging, emotional experience to which they could discuss together as doctors about that particular situation. Uh, and in this case, we used game technologies, but we used filmmaking content uh, uh, doing this 360 video experience. And we recorded it inside of a sort of the natural environment of, uh, of the healthcare system. Uh, so you would have the dirt in the corner, but obviously that's not important for the story, so nobody would look at it. You would look at what is actually relevant in the room at the time. Uh, but you end up in all kinds of really bizarre situations when you're filming towards that. For example, you, the whole lighting situation is very different. Mm -hmm. If you have two persons interacting with each other, in this case, we use a kind of embodied experience uh, with influences from a lab in Barcelona that you should look up that's called the To Be Another Lab that does just wonderful stuff. So we basically embodied the experience so that you would be inside of the body of a patient uh, meeting yourself as a doctor in a room. Um, and here we had to sort of put the camera where the person was uh, speaking to someone else but we still had to have the reply in audio in the room with a room presence. So we 
worked with binaural audio technologies in order to 3D position audio. Binaural means the different ears hear yeah, different so things. It's like 3D for the ears. Because when you do 360 video, obviously you want the audio to follow along with the video. Mm. So if you have a knocking door here, you should be able to use that as a cue to like, oh, I should turn my head around and the door opens. You shouldn't, so, so and uh, sort of the techniques to do that today are in the games context, but they aren't produced for doing video, so it's all really blurry at the time, but I think you're absolutely onto something where sort of both the sort of methodologies, tools, and concepts mashing up both theater, game, and film into that middle space would create, most likely create a totally new place with its own theories and its own field. I was, went to some VR panels in Cannes as well uh, at the next pavilion this, this spring where we were presenting too. And, uh, and it was interesting that, that the, most, the very most leading VR film studio heads, like Oculus Studios and so on in the world, they were only j just now, this spring, hiring um, AI programmers. That means the programming that you need to make a character inside your film react to things that requires some code. The people who know how to do that. Or level designers, which it means when you make choices, then some different kinds of stories appear. You need some tech on the backside of this. They were only now starting to hire people to do this. And those are, from a game's perspective, quite obvious needs. Uh, but they had tried, and they have tried for some years, to use the traditional filmmaking skill set. And like, oh, that's not quite enough for what's happening here. But Linda, where do you see this going? Do you think that, do you think that, these, that these new kinds of film storytelling platforms will add something meaningful to storytelling? What's this new flavor? What are we getting that we didn't have before? Well, I, th I think there are art forms out there that haven't yet been invented. I mean, that's what really excites me. I got, this, got into this about 10 years ago, and I was creating things that were not possible technically to do. People were, were very excited by it. I just don't know in some ways where, where this will go. Um, I, I do know that one of my experiences with, with people from games is that they have a very limited idea of storytelling. They have a story, and I, I think it comes partly from the, from the idea that the player has to have agency. Mm -hmm. And it also comes from the, from the fact that they're being given this very linear model of storytelling, which is the, the Hollywood model, and it's one hero on a single linear journey. Um, and what if, if you imagine, if, if you start, it, you know when you go into Google Maps and you can see a map of an overall area and then you can pick up this little, little stick person and you can walk along the street. When you're walking along the street, you, you cannot see what's beyond. So therefore, they're always creating their stories like the little person walking along the street because they're in the head of the player. Well, I would be staying, saying as a storyteller, you need to have a, a, a much greater overview of the story and I would be doing what traditional storytellers have, have done forever and that is starting midway through the story so you instantly create a mystery and you create emotional engagement. And I think that that's something that they're asking me to talk to them about um, because you see at the most basic level, a lot of the dialogue in this is in these pieces is just dire. And uh, you know, you could say, okay, I'm talking to people like cut that dialogue down because when I'm standing talking to this this person who's rambling on, I'm actually not looking at them. You know, I'm looking around. If you can do fast dialogue and simple dialogue skills, um, story structure skills. All the stuff that, that writers have been doing meshed with all of this wonderful new stuff is just very powerful. And I li love the idea of lots of different forms of storytelling, the transmedia stuff. I, the, the terms now are so... I keep finding terms that I don't understand. So what I get from it is this wonderful new set of art forms. Now, the kind of installations, for example, you see in art galleries, I think often are really very poor. The production values are very poor. The message is very banal. Mm -hmm. I think that we have ex uh, there's a, there are art forms here, very powerful art forms, where you can actually make people think. You can you can actually come as an artist to to the situation. And I do, I think that we need to remember. You're very right about the thing. I found that a very interesting talk. But you know Shakespeare was a theatre man, mm -hmm. and he worked for his theatre, and he only wrote. I don't know whether you know this. 
Uh, he wrote The Merchant of Venice, which is a story about a, a Jewish merchant. He only wrote that because around the corner, Christopher Marlowe was doing very good business with a play called The Jew of Malta. And they said, drop everything, write a play about a Jew because we need to get these audiences back. That's been the job, you know. So it's interesting. So, um, yeah, sorry. That's sort of the working writer's job. So I'd be saying... I really don't know what's happening. I think it's hugely, fascinatingly exciting, and we need to uh, to join together to use all of this stuff to make it happen. And I think we need to bring the neurologists in, because something I'm interested in is selective attention, where you don't see something because you're distracted by something else. I think we could use that for drama, but I think a lot of it is about getting the emotions moving Beca and the, the chemicals moving because of emotional mm. engagement. So, Carl, yeah. what were you thinking? No, I was just thinking, we did a fun experiment in our lab last summer where we connected an audience with neural technologies and we had three lecturers lecture in what we call the battle of the minds to see who could contain engagement the longest time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and obviously we didn't account for time, so the person who came out first won. <laughs> uh, because you can hold your attention most when you're first, obviously. But if we subtracted for that, we could see some, some effects. But still, I, yeah, I think there's a lot to do with neurology as well. It's just very, very, very complicated at the moment. But going back to the uh, issue of sort of um, uh, the, the story in VR, I think uh, one reason for many games or game designers to be locked up in some kinds of narratives has a lot to do with sort of how you actually code a computer. And the computer game genre has been uh, early limited towards how you actually design for that medium. That's right, and then that created a tradition yeah. which became but, a norm. Yeah, but then on the other hand, we have other game environments who are not confounded or bound by the computer. Uh, which have designed mechanics for doing complex participatory engagement stuff that are much more interesting, I think, for VR purposes. And there you have, for example, um, uh, some kinds of interactive drama, interactive um, narrative stuff like Punch Drunk Productions work, really interesting. The Nordic LARP scene uh, has a lot of design and design pattern work that would be most likely very relevant for I a VR. I should break in here and say LARP is live, live action role playing. Yeah. So at the Future of Storytelling Summit in New York last week, which gathers really sort of the very sort of heavy, tech heavy people and all the immersive theater people and so on, Nordic LARP was presented and it was in fact blowing minds because they, oh, like there are so many storytelling problems that you have solved. And it's like, yes, because we just did it in a room for 20 years. Like this, we've, we've solved some of these things. But that said, I mean, in, for instance, in any kind of just analog role playing where people are talking, the tradition of having just one character was very strong. It's relatively recently that some game, desi game designer had the genius idea that you can play, that you can switch during one game. You can play many characters, so you can inhabit many different points of view. And of course, that's also true in digital games. Of course, it's possible to immerse into more than one character. We, we, we read novels all the time. We watch movies all the time. We have no problem empathize, empathizing with more than one person. Uh, you know, we can take turns. But weirdly, the social norm of, like, in these kinds of stories, this is how we tell these stories, it's so hard to break out of that box in your mind. Yeah, and it's also hard to break out of the sort of confinement of your own body, because that's what you're used to experience when mm -hmm. you're in the physical room. Uh, working with a VR context, I mean, it is possible to be a ghost, or it is possible to do all kinds of stuff. You need to account for physio physiological issues such as nausea, for example, that are absolutely there. Uh, and a big issue still. Uh, but uh, sort of accounting for that we solve for those solutions, I think there's a lot of fun narratives that we would be able to create where you can play around with perspective or position taking. Just the thing that you would be possible to have like an audience of thousand people watching a sort of closed room thing with five live actors going on. So we're very example. close to this. I'm happy to report, having seen some of the latest uh, technology just now, that, that it's possible, there is, it's, the technology is there to do VR experiences with many participants in the same space, in, interacting with each other. And that creates some, some new... They say that, I asked somebody, when do we have the holodeck? Because uh, so live rendering is happening very fast. And now I don't remember what they're called at the top of my mind. But the company that created the motion capture technology 
technology that Avatar was built on. Um, you, if you just Google that, and you can figure out what they're working on right now, because it's very, very exciting. It's going to change a lot of these of these live rendering restrictions uh, for VR, but also for other kinds of, of filmmaking, because just processing power is so much better, and the algorithms are so much better now. Uh, <coughs> But that means that if we don't want the holodeck, like on Star Trek, the, to, to be in a room, if it can be inside the, the goggles, we're not very many years away. We're less than five years away from all of us could be in a movie where we're all characters and we're all interacting, and then suddenly we are providing some of the context. It's essentially role-playing. I can say lines, and how do we write for that? We don't even know, but it's probably some, some, somewhere between role-playing games and, and filmmaking and theatre. Or yeah, something? I would I would place it somewhere in that field. Uh, I think the sort of the uh, having a very uh, a, a good live action role playing designer meet with a with a with a, a film writer together with a person knowledgeable about the technologies of VR and sort of doing sort of co creative work in that space would probably end up with quite interesting mm -hmm. novel and in new things. I think it's worth remembering that there are two uh, very primitive needs that, that we have regarding story. One is, and you can see it in children, one is to play and one is to hear a story. And there will always be that. I had a very interesting experience the other day. I went, to, I used to do this a lot when I was doing my novels, but I went to talk to kids. These were little kids, you know, four or five years old. Some of them, some of them, uh, and I did a workshop with some eight-year-olds, and we worked on creating an episode of The Simpsons, as it were a writer's table. And they're very, very literate on that. They loved doing that, and, but they love also hearing the story. So they mm. love a controlled experience as well as a participatory experience. And I think we just have to remember that those two things, we can blur them, we can do it, but, but that's what, there are these two urges, mm. and people want to hear things, they want to, what if, and you tell me, so I can think about it, you know, that's just part do of the... Do you think, though, do you think it's, I mean, I find sometimes when, when I say that these experiences are terrible, I'm realizing now, based on what you said, which is a completely key observation, that that it's because they promise one thing and then they give you the other. They promise participation, but actually they give you listening. I'm, I love listening. I love novels. I love movies. I love movies. I love movies. But then give me a movie. It, like, it, so there's, there's something about people being a little bit confused about which urge they are in fact creating to. Yeah, you have to guide the audience into what you are doing at the moment. I think that's absolutely super true. Because, I mean, for example, going to a theatre play and then suddenly you have to be a participatory person in the audience without having that been introduced before can create a bit of tension. Or, uh, or there might be an implicit thing, like if you go to a ma magic show, you probably go and sit in the back just in case. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, I mean, those things are there, and they're very social in the context. And, I mean, if, if I know that, or if I sort of perceive that being in this experience means that somebody will tell me a really nice story, and then I don't get that, I get something... Uh, something completely different, of course I will be sort of bummed out about that. So I think, I think that's very true. You need to be uh, keen on describing sort of what are you actually going to experience in these new environments, but not sort of telling the story, of, obviously, but sort of just marking out the boundaries of sort of what will happen inside of this space that yes, we are creating briefly together. Briefly, do the last question. Go, go right ahead. Um, I, I'm very interested in the um, the social uh, aspects of this, that people love the, the water cooler moment where they go and they chat about what they've seen on television and so on, and, and in the films, and that's hugely important. And also the, the binge viewing, which I'm very interested in, is, is you know people sitting there with their drinks and their popcorn and their friends and they gather around and they all watch Doctor Who. Whatever. That's a social thing. One of the things I'm, I'm interested too, and I don't, we don't really talk about it much, but there's a huge upsurge in reality TV of the very the most boring kind, <laughs> cooking shows. And, you know, the whole of England was devastated because the great British Bake Off was, you know, somebody resigned for a cook, resigned, like, what is this? <laughs> you know, and so I think that that's, an, you know, uh, that's an interesting aspect, too, that, some, that we shouldn't actually forget if you're talking about mm -hmm. what the audience wants, because, you know, cat, 
cat videos. Oh, what is all this about? It seems to be reaching after normality. I think normality. It, it connects to the I mean, genuinity question. Yes, yes so it the, does. The, it's mm, something mm. about real people. And again, the participation. I think, I mean, because it's not just the people watching the Great British Bake Off or the Swedish equ equivalent, people are also baking more. So, so it's another way to step into that story somehow. So that need seems to be quite profound. And then, then it seems, of course, now in these terms that you just introduced, which are brilliant, that you, that you are um, switching very uh, fluently between listening to the story and playing in the story. Somehow. And that's fascinating. I think we are about to run out of time. So I, I should mention that there is uh, currently, I mean, this will be corrected very soon, but currently there is not really a business model for VR, which means that at this moment it is research labs and arts funding. And it's a lot of these, these spaces which are not controlled by business logic, which are currently doing all of the development. So this is a very, very exciting time if you're interested in this at all. Um, as you probably should be, to, to, to take a look at VR, because this also means that if you figure something out right now, um, it, it's like at the very early ages, uh, days of cinema when, when Sweden and Denmark were, were global movie powers before, before sound. Uh, it's like that. We can have that impact, we can have that importance, anywhere can have the, that Im importance, because it is really about connecting the right storytellers to the right technology and, and experimenting. I would like to, to, to end uh, on the question of, of, if we lay that aside, of all of the other platforms and all of the other storytelling, and, and I, I maybe focusing on traditional, quote-unquote, cinema, filmmaking, how, what is left for, for cinema? You mentioned before that your, your VR piece, for instance, uh, it also has a kind of transmedia logic. You would want to engage people, and then you would want them, when they leave that experience, to perhaps see a documentary or engage in some other platforms. And multi-platform storytelling has become completely normalized, but that also splits our attention. What is cinema good for? What is cinema still best at now? Uh, I would say that, I mean, there is something about the sort of uh, very directed and intentionality of a good story. And you find that in cinema, and you find that in, in short film as well. And I mean, I think one of the most important usages initially of virtual reality will be the fact that you can actually have a full screen anywhere you want mm -hmm. and actually see really good video <laughs> or film within the context of VR uh, because that becomes a nice place of doing it. So I think, I think, we'll, uh, I think there's a really good place for film. Uh, IMAX given, in the home, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you take into consideration when you design your stories that that is the context to which where your story will be. Mm. I, I think, you know, sometimes I just like to sit down and watch a, a movie or watch television. I don't want to be participating in it. And I think that that's, that's perhaps at the core of, of why we go to the cinema, to, to have this big experience in a room full of people. It's also social, you take the kids out and so on, you want to be part, part of that. Um, but it's also to do with the relaxing, mm -hmm. <laughs> not having to, to do stuff, and in a game you're doing stuff. Maybe it's as simple as that. I so some know. combination of community and not mm -hmm. having to make choices. That's yes. actually, and, and, and being, yes. Yes, being told the beautiful thing without the res be having to be responsible for it oneself. Yes, and it's also, oh, I'm going to tell you what happened to me this morning. Do you do. know what I mean? No, but no, I mean, that's what, that's oh, what yes. we go. <laughs> exactly, you know. see, see, exactly <laughs> that. Engage. I was yes. immediately like, yes, yes, yes. do. Yes. <laughs> so the that's the answer. That's yes. the answer to that question. But the interesting thing is that what I would normally do if I were telling you, my goodness, something happened to me this morning, I give you what happened, the shocking thing, and then I'd go back to the start. So, you know, I, I'm yeah. just I'm putting a little plug for, you know, non-linear is a great way of storytelling. But it's just, we sit down and we want to, you know, what if, ah, oh, I'm going to tell you a story. And that's terrific. It's a huge need that we have. And all of the social media, all of the Facebook is, tell me your story. Oh, and I'll tell you my story. And that's, yeah. that's something I think that you said. It's a, a physical, mental need, human need that we have. Yeah. Mm? Well, yeah, and also the fact that film is asynchronous. I mean, doing participation means that we have to be participatory in the moment. In real time. In real time, usually, if it is to be really good. And most th things you do are asynchronous very often. And having that sort of very rich, powerful experience, personally, 
asynchronously when I want, where I want, that will still be there. That's true. I shall say at the end that work is ongoing on next year's Nostradamus report. Uh, the date, however, I can tell you now. So towards the end of next year's Gothenburg Festival, on the 2nd of February, you should come to our international Nostradamus seminar with more speakers. And of course, that will also be the day when the next report will be released on nostradamusproject.org. Thank you so much for your focus. And a big hand to Carl Heath and Linda Aronson. Thank you. Thanks, Mikael.